rapture will happen? No one does. Will we actually go through all or part of the tribulation? Or will Jesus snatch us up before it all happens? Before the actual seven-year tribulation foretold by the prophet Daniel, though, there will be other signs that the day of the Lord is near. As Jesus describes in Matthew 24, the precursors to the tribulation, I am not too sure these events sound like a cup of tea either. Deception will be rampant. There will be wars and rumors of wars. This is happening right now. Next, the scripture says, nation will rise against nation. By the way, the Greek word translated nation is actually ethnos, which means race. Race will rise against race. We have that happening right now in America. The racial divides are deepening, not only here, but all over the world. Soon, the kingdoms of the earth will rise against each other and against the kingdom of our God. Here's the kicker. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Could the body of Christ live through famines, pestilences, and earthquakes? Yes, and there's more. As believers, we will be persecuted and be hated by all nations. People will be offended and betray and hate one another. Lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. But we must continue to preach the gospel to all the ethnic groups on the planet and then the end will come. Until recently, I had the incorrect view that the world would be much as it is now until Jesus came and raptured us out of here. Then the tribulation would start and we would watch it all from heaven. However, as I read this passage and others, I see that the world is going to continue to become darker and darker before the tribulation even begins. There is good news. God provides for his people. He watches over us. He hides us under his wings. He pays attention to the smallest little sparrow and provides for widows and orphans. Our God never slumbers or sleeps. Nothing surprises him. His angels watch over us. And in the end, Jesus wins. The provision of safety and protection has conditions though. We cannot and should not put the Lord to the test. Like Elijah, we must wait for instructions from Yahweh and follow them. We must wait patiently and we must trust no matter what. It will be increasingly important that each one of us learns to hear God's voice and immediately follow it. Like the Israelites, we need to know when to camp and when to move after the pillar of cloud. Our physical survival may depend on it. Let's check in with Elisha. The men have been out searching for Elijah and have finally returned empty-handed after three days of searching. I told them not to go, but they insisted. They knew the spirit of Elijah now rested on me, but they did not see Elijah rise as I did. I guess I can't blame them. What an exit. God certainly is full of surprises. Where was I? Oh, yes. Elijah had delivered God's message to King Ahab. He had provoked Yahweh by marrying Jezebel, the daughter of the Sidonian king, who was a priestess of Baal. He had built a temple for Baal in Samaria and an altar and had begun to serve Baal and worship him. The message to King Ahab was clear. There would not be any rain or even any dew until Elijah said so. Yahweh was showing his superiority to the pagan god Baal Melkart, lord of the weather. No one could believe the boldness of Elijah. Elijah was a praying man. He was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. For three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Oh, how I desire to be like my master. What an amazing mentor he was. Elijah followed God's instruction to flee from the wrath of Jezebel and Ahab after this pronouncement, hiding at the brook Sherith that floweth into the Jordan. Yahweh supernaturally fed him twice a day with the most unlikely of birds, the raven. Soon, though, the brook dried up, but Elijah didn't panic. The word of the Lord was with him in coming. Arise, go to... Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. 
I am sure Elijah must have spoken to God in surprise. You are sending me to Jezebel's home country to have a foreign woman take care of me? But I can go see his grinning face in my mind and hear his response to Yahweh. All right, off I go. I am sure his faith was buoyed. Elijah had been fed by ravens. Why not a widow woman? Why not a foreign believer of Yahweh living in the middle of a pagan culture in the middle of the drought? Yahweh could do anything. Why, he could bring water out of a rock in the middle of the desert. He could rain manna from heaven. When Elijah arrived at the gate of the city, he noticed the woman gathering sticks. I still wonder how Elijah knew this was the woman God was speaking of. She obviously was waiting for him. He was looking for her. In any case, he asked her for a drink of water. Isn't this interesting? Elijah told me that one day our Messiah would ask a woman the same thing, a Samaritan and a foreigner to boot. Anyway, the widow woman agreed to give him water. My guess is that she surmised it was Elijah from his clothing. Frankly, he really did look a bit strange. He wore a gar garment of hair with a belt around his waist, but he never worried about standing out in a crowd. It seemed he delighted in the fact that Yahweh had called him to be different. Anyway, as she was going to bring the water to Elijah, he also asked for a bite to eat. She knew for sure then this Israelite must be the man of God had commanded her to provide for her. Then the woman swore in the name of Yahweh that she had no food, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. She had been gathering sticks to cook a last meal for herself and her son to prepare to die. I'm sure she was thinking, why did Yahweh ask me to provide for a man of God when I have no food to eat myself? Elijah was undaunted. He already knew she had no food. The Lord God of Israel had told him what to expect. He told the widow not to fear, but to make him a little cake first, of what flour and oil she had left, and then to make some of herself and her son. God had promised them all a miracle provision. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain. In 1 Kings 17. 14. It all happened as Yahweh said. Elijah stayed with the widow and her son, and they all ate for many days, along with her entire household. Sometime later, the same widow's son became ill and quit breathing. She carried her sick child weeping to Elijah. Without thinking, she asked Elijah, Is this a judgment of God for my sin? How often do we ask Yahweh this question ourselves when things go wrong? Elijah took the child from her and took him upstairs to his own room and laid the child on the bed. Elijah prayed in earnest. Is this what is happening here, Lord, divine judgment? Show me. So Elijah stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. I can just imagine the joy of Elijah and the widow when he handed her back her son alive. He told me she looked into his eyes, glistening with tears, and said, Now I know you are a true prophet of God. She had experienced the miracle provision, but it was not enough. She needed to see someone rise from the dead to believe. Someday another son, the son of Yahweh, would also perform a miracle provision with five loaves and two fishes, and the son of God would himself rise from the dead. Elijah taught me that through faith in him, we will not receive the penalty of death for our sins. Mankind will receive the gift of life. Oh, how I wish to see that day. I am sure that as the last days approach, we must focus not on the battles before us, but on the glory and victory of the Lord that is coming on the earth. Elijah waited patiently and prayed during the famine, obeying God and relying on God's word and his provision. Elijah did not step out on his own. He listened to Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. The miracles of provision must have boosted his faith. We too can expect miracles as the days get darker. Elijah, like many of the other prophets, was refined in fire while depending on God to care for him in the wilderness and in Zarephath, a land entrenched with Baal worship, God was strengthening Elijah's faith to run toward the great battle, not away from it when the time comes. 
That time for Elijah was coming fast, and that time is about to begin for us too. While we're in the waiting time, it's important to stay vigilant. Hear our instructions from the Holy Spirit and learn from anointed believers of God. We need to be discerning and test the spirits like Elijah. The times have changed. In these last days, evil is being intensified on the earth. And we who walk in the light will be able to see this evil even more clearly. We must be determined, like Elijah, not to be overwhelmed by the evil growing darker around us. Here are some strategies from Elijah for survival in a drought. First, drink deeply from the living water every day. You must have water every day. Of course, that is the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Number two, discipline yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit to be joyful no matter what and maintain an unshakable peace. These are important weapons. But they require discipline. Three, remember to fly high and see things from God's point of view. Four, think of others. Selfishness is one of the core evils that we are fighting. Five, trust in God's provision. Six, follow God's word. And seven, Listen for God's instructions and obey them. We'll see you in lesson four. And the lover of my soul, creator God, he 